I'm Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. Now, I know that you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am delighted to welcome my very special guest to the show today, Farai Chidea. Farai, welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be with you. Well, I am thrilled. I'm eager to talk about you and your book, and I want to tell our listening audience all about you, Farai. You bring the human experience alive in media. Farai Chidea is Publisher Weekly calls her new book, The Episodic Career, How to Thrive at Work in the Age of Disruption, a smart and savvy guide to help forge the best and most fulfilling career path. A fiction and nonfiction author who has published six books, Farai is also a broadcaster and a senior writer at the data and political site 538.com. She's covered every presidential election since 1996 and interviewed subjects including self-made billionaires, violent criminals, and Katrina survivors. She's a former on-air reporter and host for ABC News. CNN, and NPR, where she hosted the program News and Notes. And I am so excited to welcome you to the show, and we're going to dive into a juicy conversation about your book. But let's get started, Farai. What made you to decide to write this book, The Episodic Career? Well, you know, being a journalist is a very uh, up-and-down career. So it's one of these things where I have been laid off from NPR during a a huge budget cut wave. I've had other publications shrink out from underneath me. And I've had to adapt and learn. But also, on top of that, I've spent a lot of time covering politics and the economy. And I saw that all roads led back to jobs. Yeah. Um, How people felt about politics, how people felt about themselves, their self-esteem, their families went back to work over and over again. And I just think that so many different aspects of our lives, from our physical and mental health to our personal relationships, come back to how well we synthesize our ability to work and our ability to live. And that's really what I'm talking about. It's not just about work. It's about finding a way to synthesize a good life. And I really appreciate that phrase, synthesize a good life, for I. And I couldn't agree more. You know, you and I are kindred spirits in many ways. And, and I think it's a journey. It's not just a one uh, job. And, and I love hearing about your career, past, present, and future. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about the term episodic career. So unpack that for the listening audience. Oh, absolutely. So the episodic career is really, it's a departure from the whole idea that a career was something you started out of high school or college, depending on your track. And it was like an escalator. You got on and you rode all the way up to the top and then you got a gold watch and you walked off the escalator into the sunset of retirement. (laughs) And that's just not the way things work anymore. Um, An episodic career is where you can either switch from very different, all ones that you have a connection to or you train yourself for, or sometimes it's simultaneous uh, micro careers. So for example, I met a woman the other day who is a patent attorney and a photographer. And she made it, made a very clear decision that, you know, she was making her money as a patent attorney and that's still most of her income, but it was important for her to treat her photography as a business because that meant she didn't feel as guilty about spending time on it. And now she makes You know, she was doing so much work for free, but now she has a nice kind of side job. It's not going to pay the mortgage, but it'll pay for a lot of other things. And so it can either be sequential or or it can be simultaneous, but it's about using all of yourself in the workplace and not being fixed on one idea of what it is you should be doing. I really like that term micro career and and you can't see me but I'm smiling ear to ear because that patent lawyer is feeding her soul and her creative side with her photography, right? So mm-hmm. I love that it's not a one size fit, fits all. So walk me through because you talk about this so beautifully in the book how the job market has really changed since our parents and even our grandparents are in the workforce. And I know a lot of individuals, especially younger professionals, struggle because their family members don't get how the world of work has changed. Absolutely. Well, just to give you an example, I I 
was lucky enough to have an amazing mentor straight I wouldn't even say straight out of college because he was my boss in college when I was an intern and then after college for a while. And um, at one point in my career, um, he, you know, was doing a check in on me and he looked at my resume and he said, you're switching jobs too often. But in the in the long run, it's really helped me because I know how to do video audio, print, and digital. And I know how to do survey research, all these different things. And that's because I've been adaptable. But I entered journalism at a time when people kind of were stuck in certain tracks, like you were either a writer or a TV person, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was there for the transition. And luckily, when I was moving around, I was part of that transition. And so now younger people in particular are going to have you know, 10 job, ten or more job changes in one lifetime, many of them career changes as well. And the distinction to me is, you know, you can have one job in marketing and take another job in marketing and be doing pretty much the same thing, but you could, you know, take a career leap. So I profile someone in the book who went from being a lawyer to a journalist to a marketing executive. Um, but they were all skills that related to how she was able to bring herself into the world. And so you have to be adaptable to the workplace and you have to find places that respect your intelligence and respect your work ethic. But they may be very different from each other. And I hope that our listeners really find it a great comfort that change is no longer a red flag, right? That the beauty of being um, well-versed in a variety of different fields and competencies competencies and skill sets is a great help. It's a great asset in your professional portfolio. And I also love that you're giving people permission to say, it's okay. Change your mind. That's okay. You you have the power. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to have that freedom or else, I mean, you know, there are times at which journalism has been very favorable to me and times at which it hasn't. And that's okay because I, I'm adaptable. Um, but I think that a lot of times I've seen people who really love one thing and they paint themselves into a corner. Yeah, yeah. They love this one thing and they don't realize that it's kind of like it's it's a shrinking pool and all of a sudden they're the guppy in like an inch of water. <laughs> And yeah. they they don't realize that they it would have been better off if they had adapted two years ago or five years ago. And you don't want to wait until that point when you have no choice. You want to be able to make changes when you still have more choices. Yeah, and when you have a say in the matter. For I, you speak so beautifully in the book about gender disparity, which is still a reality. Talk to me about that. Are there differences between men and women being laid off and finding new employment and being resilient? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that women women are very adaptable, um, but the reality is that when it comes to upper management, women still don't have a lot of the same advantages as men. And what I mean by that is I go into several studies in the book that show that women who negotiate hard and who are unapologetic about their worth are punished for it very often in negotiations. And so they have to make a case like I'm good for the company. And, you know, I mean, obviously everyone has to make that case, but the the whole framework of the case has to be, if you want a promotion that this is good for the company and it's good for the ecosystem. Whereas a man can walk in more and uh, easily and just say, I got this counter offer. What are you going to do? And that's considered a perfectly good bargaining strategy for a man, but yeah. women are not treated the same way as men. And very often, um, I also talk about an anecdotal example where uh, a person who was in a managerial position told me that all of the white men offered promotions at his company, asked for more money. None of the women and none of the people of color asked for more money. And I think it's a level of fear. It's yeah. fear of being perceived as greedy, fear of being perceived as not a team player. And unfortunately, there seems to be some reality behind those fears only in the sense of perception, that people don't view women as um, worthy of stating their own worth in the marketplace. Unless, I mean, you know, you can become very powerful and then you have more latitude, but but study after study shows that by and large, women have to make group-based arguments 
where men can make more individual-based arguments. And you know you'll never get it if you don't ask, so it's worth taking the risk and it's worth asking. And you know, I also find too, coaching individuals in the job place, um, seeking out work and, and negotiating salaries, employers expect you to negotiate. Absolutely. Don't disappoint them, right? No, and, and I'm not arguing against negotiating. Oh, no, I hear you. I hear you, you loud and clearly. Know, yeah. People should know, women should know, that there are certain expectations. So don't lead with necessarily, you know, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, even though you are. Lead with your company could benefit yeah. from my expertise because of, or this promotion would be great for everyone because of, I mean, I think that there's certain framings and, yes. and some of the studies talk about a whole way of framing things. And I'm sure you're much more experienced at this than I am, but there's a way of kind of using win-win language in exactly. order to frame your argument for, for moving up. But even if it scares the daylights out of you, do ask and work with someone to practice on that. So thanks for, I, I appreciate your wisdom on that. So let's talk about our, our wonderful new college grads, right? The newest generation in the workforce are millennials at, who in 2020 are going to be 50% of our working population. It's a different job world for them. What do you recommend for our recent college grads? How should they behave differently in the job search? Well, I think first of all, um, every person, but particularly recent college grads, has to take an assessment of what they think their earnings trajectory is. And it's really hard for recent college graduates because you have very little experience. But I have friends, I'm 46 years old. I have friends who are retired who are my age. And I have friends who have kind of taken a vow of poverty and decided to do something artistic or exciting with their life. And uh -huh. they you know, they scrape by, but they don't, they're not bothered by it because they've made a decision or they're not overly bothered by it. Mm -hmm. And so it's the whole spectrum of what you can accomplish in a certain amount of time. So, so if you have college mm -hmm. debt, which most people are going to, if they've gone to college, really say, well, how much do I need to do to pay down this debt? How much do I need to live in, you know, this city versus that city? Like, right. don't, don't always go for the most expensive city, the most exciting city. Um, and you have to just be realistic about it. But then also you have to go in and go hard to get early experience in whatever field it is of your choice. So sometimes the first year or two of employment isn't going to be very lucrative, but it's it's the way that you kind of pay your way in. But but if you, for example, are entering a field that has perpetually low earnings and you have high college debts, that just doesn't work. So, for example, I know a young journalist who is very clear about what she wants to do. And I keep bringing up journalists because I am one. Sure. But, yeah. but, you know, but she's clear about what she wants to do. and She knows it doesn't pay that much. And she waitresses at a fancy New York restaurant part time. And that's not going to be everybody's dream, but it allows her to travel internationally and it allows her to do what she wants to do. She can take a shift when she wants. And for some people, they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, why would you? And she's someone who has a graduate degree. And, and like, why would you waitress? Well, it allows her to lead the, the kind of life she wants to lead. She can make a lot of money quickly at this high end restaurant and then she can go off for three weeks to Latin America. Um, not everyone is going to have that kind of a stark thing, but she has, she has a very practical Midwestern idea of how she's going to balance the scales. And you just can't be unrealistic. So if you're going to be in a low earnings profession, something's got to give. You've either got to live cheaply. You have to have a patron saint. I've, I haven't <laughs> found one yet. I don't know. I, Let I me know. <laughs> um, so, so I think that for college grads, there's this tension between, um, moving deeply into a field you care about, but also thinking about the future. And the future sneaks up on you. It comes fast. It does. It really does. And, you know, that was a beautiful illustration of this friend of yours. 
playing to her values. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I think it's wonderful. You're saying, look, let's, let's not judge her. Let's celebrate her for doing exactly what she wants. And perhaps the restaurant gig is exactly what she needs in flexibility and quick earning potential to feed her other dreams. So well done. Well done. So in the book, you talk about uh, how someone can decide whether or not to stay in a job or seek employment elsewhere. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Because that's a tough question. Yeah, it is. And and so again, you know, the the sort of three things I ask people to really look at in this book are you know, what are your own desires for your life, not just for your work? What does the market say and how emotionally resilient are you? Mm-hmm. And so I think that when it comes to leaving a job, all of those things play into it. Of course, there's your personal desires, but what does the market say? Is this job going to be around in six months, two years, five years, 10 years? Is there a track to move ahead? Is there a future in this? Um, You have to understand the labor market in order to understand that, both national and local. And then the other part is emotional resilience. Like, in general, it's not a great idea to quit a job without having another job. But if you are becoming the kind of person who is losing your mind at work, that's it's not worth it. It's you not. Have yeah. To figure out a way to step away from that. And so there are times where you really do just have to leave. You've got some really concrete tips for job seekers and, and of any age. I need to, to clarify that. And what should these folks keep in mind when they're looking for a new position? Well, when people are looking for a new position, first mm-hmm. of all, um, just to get back to that whole idea of job hunting, it's really much more helpful to come from a position of looking while you have another job. And this gets more important as you get older. So people in their um, mid fifties and above really do much better job hunting when they already have a job. People in their twenties are expected to kind of float in and out of the workplace a little bit. And it's not viewed as punitively, but once you um, reach a certain age and stage, then you're punished pretty heavily for, for not having a job. So it's important if you've been laid off or something to, to get another job quickly. So what you look for may depend on how, how urgent it is to get another job going. But, um, again, really when it comes to job search and to keeping a job, you want to decide what your networking strategy is. Networking is the really the most important thing in job search today. Agreed. Whether you're focused on local jobs or national companies, because a lot of times local jobs, you can literally walk up to a small local company and they will tell you what jobs they have open. If you're going for a place like Google or a, a big national company, it's a completely different ball game. And there's often evaluation tests and, and much more formal ways of approaching that. And then when it comes to, again, choosing a career path, it's really about deciding whether or not there is a future in what you're doing and how long you need to stay in that field. Good stuff. Good stuff. So do you think it's going to get better or worse for people working in 2016 as we head into a new year? It's going to get better for people who are better informed. And that's, I think, the main reason I wrote this book is because I saw a lot of pain and I saw a lot of people who were confused. And the thing is, there are a lot of ways to make your way in this workplace, but you have to be well informed. You can't just sort of be in duck and cover mode. You have to look at the economy. You have to look at your local job search and you have to make decisions that are that you're passionate about. I agree. And I would add to that just to dovetail on exactly what you said. You've got to be active. You've got to be involved. You can't be passive, right? You, you've got to take control of your career destiny and it starts by being well-informed. Yeah. Brian, let's talk a little bit about the ever elusive work-life balance. What's your, what's your best advice? Well, you know, I, I am a huge medical research fan. Uh, My sister's a doctor. My mom was a med tech for a while. And I myself gained 40 pounds when I was on one job because I just let stress totally get away from me. And I talk about that in the book. And then I talk about the ways in which job stress can be really, really difficult and challenging to your physical health and your mental health. And so I think it's important that each of us put ourselves first 
And people like Oprah talk about this all the time, how putting yourself first doesn't have to be selfish. It can be this act of self-love and self-preservation, which then gives you the capacity to really help other people in your life. But a lot of times, like I took, I did some original survey research and two thirds of people said that they had sacrificed their health and well being for work at some point. That's and a huge I'm one of those number. Wow. Yeah, two thirds. I'm one of those two thirds. Yeah. And, and I just really don't do it to the extent I used to. I mean, sometimes you back yourself into a corner, but I really make time to, you know, meditate, work out, have a spiritual practice, spend time with family. And I know everyone has different circumstances, but the reality is you have to put yourself and your health and well-being first when you start thinking about your options. If money alone is first or anything else alone is first, eventually you'll burn out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no one else will prioritize you. It's our responsibility as humans to take care of ourselves. And as you said, self-preservation. And I agree, it's not selfish. It's the smartest thing that you can do. And you'll be a better sister, mother, spouse, wife, partner, colleague, friend, husband, brother, you know, whatever, because you're taking better care of yourself. Good stuff. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about your, your amazing work-life matrix in the book. How'd you come up with that? It, it, so the work life matrix is a system where I um, help everyone who's reading this book evaluate themselves on four different categories, including how much risk you're willing to take in the workplace and whether you like making decisions alone or, or with a team. And this was based on years. Being a reporter is, I joke, it's kind of like halfway between being an anthropologist and a priest. <laughs> you know, people are always confessing things to yeah, you. Yeah, I bet. And I'm not even, that's not even a metaphor. It's like, it's amazing to me still that people will tell me all sorts of things about themselves. And then you're, you're examining their lives for clues. Yeah. Um, and so I found that, that the, the things that I uh, surfaced in the work-life matrix were things that were common themes in how people evaluated what they were willing to do. So, for example, most people are cautious about their career choices, but the people who are risk takers are disproportionately likely to be self-employed and also um, likelier to have higher incomes overall. So it's not about you picking a category because you think it's the, you know, it's, it's like, it's a better category. Yeah, it's about yeah. you understanding yourself. If you're not the kind of person who wants to take a lot of risk, then you shouldn't be someone who does it just because you think you might earn more because you probably won't. You'll probably just be afraid. So it's really a self-diagnostic tool to help you understand what really motivates you. Another thing that I found out with, um, you know, doing the research was that one of them is about, are you driven to, uh, essentially, are you driven by passion at work or, or problem solving for a larger cause? Or do you work for money and then solve other problems other ways, like volunteering? People who work for money are actually happier than the people who work for passion. And it wow. makes perfect sense to me because money is a very concrete yep. thing. Yeah, the clarity is out to save the world or out to be an artist. It's a never ending yeah, thing. Yeah, it's more of an ambiguous quest. Wow, fascinating stuff. And I, I love that you're really diving into self actualization and self reflection because I can tell you as a career coach, we don't often give ourselves time to think about what, what we're uh, driven by, what we value, what's important to us. And that's where it all starts. And you nailed it, my dear. For I today, a great new book called The Episodic Career. Tell us how we can buy it. Well, it should be in bookstores, online, and physical, just about every place. And uh, my website is farai.com, F-A-R-A-I.com. So I'll have some links there. And my Twitter is farai. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm really excited. I'm so thrilled to be interviewed by you. And I really appreciate the work that you do and the wisdom that you give to everyone who listens to you and hears you. Well, thanks, Farai. Cheers to you. I hope our professional paths cross again, and I will be recommending your book widely. And I'm so grateful that you shared your time and, and wisdom with us today on the show. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. You take care. You too. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care. Thank you.